just plain weather. October 16th, 2017. There are crooks everywhere you look now. The situation is desperate. These were the last words ever written by Daphne Caruana Galizia. She was under no illusions. She knew her journalism had made her some serious enemies. For decades, she'd been a thorn in the side of the rich and powerful here in Malta, calling out corruption and organized crime at the highest level. She paid the ultimate price. And that day, my mother and I were sitting at, uh, sitting at the, the big dining table that we used as a desk. It was just before 3 p.m. My mother needed to go to the bank for a meeting about her bank accounts, which had been frozen by the economy minister. And that was the last time I saw her. The sound of the blast, in fact, came very soon. I remember because I was listening to music on my laptop uh, when my mother left the house and when I heard the sound of the explosion, the same song was still playing. I knew it was a bomb straight away. I don't, it's, it's just the sound of it. it. It can't be anything else. Daphne Caruana Galizia was no stranger to breaking big stories. By 2017, her years of reporting on financial corruption had amounted to something extraordinary. Embezzlement on a massive scale involving some of Malta's most senior political figures, including the Prime Minister. To understand this story, here are some of the names you need to know. Keith Skembri, the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff. Conrad Mitzi, the Energy Minister. And Jorgen Fenwick, a businessman, one of Malta's richest men. Malta's Prime Minister, Chief of Staff. And Malta's Energy Minister. The first week that they came to power in March 2013, got their accountants to set up for them secret companies in Panama. In parallel with this, these two people, Keach Cambry and Conrad Mitzi, closed a deal with an energy company to provide a new gas power station and the energy coming from it. Daphne Caruana Galicia was piecing together a picture where the owners and the promoters of this project took enormous bribes, $5,000 a day, a corrupt deal, which they sought to cover up. Revealing what's become known as the Electrogas deal wasn't the work of a national newspaper or a TV station. It all came from a single journalist. Reporting on an island of less than half a million people, Caruana Galizia's blog regularly attracted upwards of 400,000 readers a day. And since its inception in 2008, the story she broke reshaped the political landscape. Take Pilatus, a secretive bank she discovered was laundering the money of senior officials. Or the passport for cash scheme, lining the pockets of politicians. But when Caruana Galizia started to uncover the level of corruption behind the electrogas deal, some Maltese found it hard to believe. This was Netflix material. And, and, and because, it, because it was like that, we didn't even think it was possible for it to be real. Because it was so surreal at times, we thought this may have been all too big to be true. Maybe that's where some of us were wrong, when we didn't really, really believe everything she said. Mark Lawrence Zemit hosts Sharabank, Malta's most popular TV show on the public broadcaster. As he says, the mainstream media found Caruana Galizia's exposés almost impossible to believe and largely ignored her work. Some outlets were actively hostile, since much of the media in Malta is dominated by the same political parties her work exposed. We conducted an investigation for six months into the online hate machine that was run by the Labour Party in government. We managed to gain access to um, secret and closed uh, uh, groups online. Members of these groups included the President of Malta, the Prime Minister of Malta, most of the members of Parliament. People were encouraged to follow her and put photos of her online. She was depicted as a witch, um, she'd be burnt at the stake. Daphne uh, was the victim of a dehumanization campaign that lasted um, around 30 years. 
When I was nine years old, the front door of the house was set on fire. When I was maybe about seven years old, I remember coming home and finding our pet dog on the doorstep with its throat slit. And I just thought that this kind of stuff was normal because my mother was the only journalist I knew. Obviously, I was a kid. It's like 200 meters, more or less. After years of threats, intimidation and attacks on her and her family, Daphne Caruana Galizia was killed by a bomb planted in her car. We're doing the same drive she did that day. This is the actual bomb site just here to the right. Wow, it really is so close to the house. This is where her killers tried to bury her work to stop the revelatory stories of corruption she was uncovering. And it might have worked, if not for a group of journalists from around the world who've set up something they call the Daphne Project, and they've made it their mission to finish what she started. The biggest scoop then of the Daphne Project was finding who owned the company that was going to pay into the Panama companies of Keech Cambry and Conrad Mitzi. And that was Jorgen Fennec, the person whom Daphne had not named herself, but had started the story that would eventually name him as the person who bribed Keech Cambry and Conrad Mitzi. And then the penny dropped. She revealed the existence of a company called 17 Black. And we now know through uh, investigations that continued after her assassination that 17 Black was owned by uh, Jürgen Fennec, who has now been arrested as the um, mastermind in, in her assassination. Uh, further revelations have also linked Jürgen Fennec to um, the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff and other members of government. Remember those names? Jürgen Fennec, arrested. Conrad Mitzi, resigned. Key Skembri, gone. And, more than two years after Caruana Galizia's death, the Prime Minister himself, Joseph Muscat, forced out. Now, her revelations are all anyone in the Maltese media can talk about. The chief of staff, the prime minister, all minister, Karel Mitzi, can say that it was a euro that we had for you. But it wasn't always that way. There were times when she wasn't right. There were times when her stories were not true. And maybe that is what led many people to believe that, that the big scandals may also have been not completely or entirely true. We're now learning that it was all true. Daphne has generated this wave of new energy, of new, of new interest, which we didn't have before in politics. And so we have people coming together and saying, OK, let's stand up to this, because this is not who we are. And that's nice, and that's good. You say it's worked and it's nice and all this is true, but she lost her life in the process. Of course, that should have never happened. She did lose her life and as a Maltese people, uh, we realized a little too late, but I believe it's better late than never. But for her supporters, it's not enough. Every night since Caruana and Galizia's death, campaigners and supporters have come here to lay out a candle-lit memorial. Every night, authorities cleared it away, or more recently, have tried to cover it up entirely. It's come to symbolize the growing confrontation between a government trying to hide its guilt and a society calling for the truth to come to light. There will eventually come a time when there will be an opportunity for accountability, and when that time comes, um, we will have to rely on the sort of work that was done by journalists like my mother. And I think that all of this work that she did has really sort of proved her right.